Hello everyone. This advanced EKG video is on the topic of ventricular tachycardia. It will assume that you're already a little familiar with the EKG characteristics of VT as a general category of arrhythmias, but by the end of the video, you'll be able to describe the different ways in which VT can be classified, including the distinction between scar-related and idiopathic VT, to identify the approximate site of origin of a VT, and to identify common idiopathic VTs. Today, I'll not be discussing specific features of the congenital arrhythmogenic syndromes of those hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Brugada syndrome, and rhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia are discussed in a separate video on sudden cardiac death, while long QT syndrome is discussed in a separate video on the QT interval. VT can be classified in a number of different ways by duration, morphology, mechanism, the clinical state of the patient, and lastly, the anatomic location of its site of origin. I'm going to go through these one at a time, starting with duration. When considering duration, there are two basic categories, non-sustained VT, usually abbreviated NSVT, is an episode of VT that lasts at least either three or four beats, but less than or equal to 30 seconds. Here's an example of some NSVT. The term salvo is sometimes used to describe recurrent bursts of three to six beats. Regarding the second set seen here, some clinicians would refer to this as a salvo, while others might call it a PVC triplet. That is just semantics. In contrast to NSVT, sustained VT is that which lasts longer than 30 seconds. With morphology, there are three general patterns. Monomorphic VT means that all QRS complexes are identical, implying that the anatomic origin of the rhythm and surrounding electrophysiologic substrate is consistent throughout its duration. This is by far the most common morphologic form. Polymorphic VT means that there are many different morphologies of the QRS complexes. And third, discussed much less commonly, is pleomorphic VT. This is VT in which there are two or three different morphologies, and a rhythm seems to slide back and forth between them over time. In addition to these three general categories of morphology, there are two specific forms of VT whose morphologies are very distinctive. One is called torsade de pont, or just torsade for short. This is a subtype of polymorphic VT seen only in patients with long QT intervals. In torsade, the QRS complexes, more specifically the QRS axis, displays a cyclic oscillation. The second is called bidirectional VT, in which there are two different QRS morphologies but instead of moving back and forth between them after many beats, as with pleomorphic VT, it alternates every other beat. This unusual and dangerous rhythm is predominantly associated with digoxin toxicity. Moving on, VT can also be classified based on the underlying mechanism. In a previous video in this series, I discussed that there are three general mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias re-entry, increased automaticity, and triggered activity. When it comes to a practical approach to classifying VT by mechanism, electrophysiologists consider two categories, re-entry versus focal, in which focal includes both increased automaticity and triggered activity. Alternatively, VT can be classified mechanistically as scar-related, which refers to both large discrete physical scars from a prior infarct, as well as more diffuse scarring from other forms of cardiomyopathy or structural heart disease, versus idiopathic VT, which is not associated with structural heart disease. Scar-related VT is primarily reentrant, patients are older, and prognosis is relatively worse. Idiopathic VT is primarily focal, patients are younger, and prognosis is relatively better. Next, VT can be classified based on the clinical stability of the patient. 
hemodynamically stable versus unstable. As a very general rule, scar-based VT tends to be less stable than idiopathic VT, though this is largely because patients in the latter category do not have ischemic heart disease or heart failure, by definition. The last way in which VT can be classified is location. I've left this to the end because it is much more complicated than the preceding four classifications. And as the title suggests, everything we do to localize VT also applies to localizing the site of origin for PVCs. There are three things to keep in mind before jumping into the details. First, the vectors of the leads, both the six frontal leads as well as the six precordial leads. Second, the morphology of QRS complexes during VT depend not only on the location of the VT, but also on the underlying anatomy and orientation of the patient's heart itself, just as not all patients have the same baseline QRS access or precordial R-wave transition point, we should not expect all patients with VT arising from the same place to have identical EKGs. There will be some degree of variability. And third, there is not one universally accepted approach to localization. As with many things in medicine, there is a trade-off between complexity and accuracy. The approach I'll discuss here errs a little on simplicity because only electrophysiologists who perform VT ablations would ever need to know more details than this, but as a consequence, there is a modest sacrifice in accuracy. When examining a 12-lead EKG of VT, in order to localize it, one can use four questions. The first three have a dichotomous answer. For example, is the QRS complex in V1 predominantly upright or predominantly downgoing? This is often referred to as a right bundle versus left bundle morphology based on what the QRS complexes in V1 look like in those two conditions. However, I find that terminology a little misleading, hence me placing quotation marks around RBBB and LBBB. The example on the left here, with a tall notched R wave, would be considered a so-called right bundle branch block pattern when localizing VT, but a small preceding Q wave and a taller left bunny ear than right would make this not typical of an actual right bundle branch block. Regardless, though, the general idea with this question is that it helps to localize the VT to one of the two ventricles. A right bundle branch block pattern in V1 suggests an origin in the left ventricle. While you might guess that a left bundle branch block pattern suggests an origin in the right ventricle, and that is to some extent true, scar-related VT originating from the RV is relatively uncommon. So VTs with left bundle patterns are more often from the septum than the RV. The next question, is the QRS in lead one upright or downgoing? Remember that lead one points from the right to the left, so an upright QRS in one suggests right to left depolarization of the heart, specifically right to left depolarization of the more massive left ventricle. So that suggests a more septal location whereas a negative complex in one suggests a left-to-right depolarization from a more lateral location. One caveat to this is because of how the apex of the heart curves laterally to the left, an apical septal site of origin can actually cause a rightward axis. The third question, are the QRS complexes in the inferior leads upright or downgoing? Upright in the inferior leads, that is, an inferiorly directed QRS axis, suggests an anterior location, while downgoing in the inferior leads, that is, a superiorly directed QRS axis, suggests an inferior location. This pairing of inferior with anterior may seem unexpected, since in common usage, we don't think of those two sides of a structure as being opposite one another. For example, the anterior and inferior sides of a cube are adjacent to one another, not opposite. But the heart is an irregularly shaped object, and as we saw a little bit in the videos on EKGs and acute MIs, the inferior and anterior leads 
can act electrocardiographically as if they are more opposite one another than adjacent. From these first three questions, there is a standardized nomenclature used to describe the QRS morphology in VT and thus its anatomic location. As far as I know, the following nomenclature does not have a formal name, but it does show up in both the EP literature and during informal conversations in the EP lab. This is what it looks like. There are three positions, one for each question. The first position is either RB or LB for right versus left bundle morphology. The second position is either L or R for leftward or rightward. And the third position is either I or S for either inferior or superior axis. From these three positions, each with two possible designations, we have eight possible combinations. Each combination suggests one relatively specific site of origin of the VT. So if one electrophysiologist wrote in the chart that they had ablated an RBRS VT, another would know that it was in either the inferior lateral or inferior apical region of the left ventricle. You'll notice in the chart here that I indicate this nomenclature is used for scar-related VT. While the principles of localization shown here generally work for idiopathic VT also, idiopathic VT usually maps to more specific locations since there are specific places in the heart from where they tend to originate, such as the posterior medial papillary muscle or the left aortic cusp. So cardiologists just refer to their location by anatomic structure, whereas with scar-related VT, they can occur anywhere in the myocardium, hence the reason for a separate classification system. I mentioned that there were four questions to ask when it comes to localization of VT. The last is not part of the preceding nomenclature, partially because its answer is not dichotomous. The question here is where does the R-wave transition occur in the precordial leads? That transition suggests the site of origin along the base to apex axis. For example, if there is positive concordance, meaning that all QRS complexes in the precordial leads are fully upright, consisting of only an R wave, that suggests a basal location from which the depolarization wavefront originates. If there is negative concordance, meaning the V1 through V6 leads all have QS complexes, that suggests an apical location. And if there is not concordance, meaning that some complexes are predominantly positive while others are negative, where the transition occurs provides information about how far from the base to apex the site of origin is located. That may be a little confusing, so let's look at some examples. If there is not concordance, the interpretation changes depending on whether the EKG has a right or left bundle pattern in V1. If the pattern is right bundle, the later the transition from positive to negative, the more basal the location. If the pattern is left bundle, the later the transition from negative to positive, the more apical the location. Let me show you a couple of full 12 lead examples. Here's an EKG. We've actually seen this one before in the video on basic tachyarrhythmia identification, where we identified it as a regular wide complex tachycardia without consistent P waves, but with possible AV dissociation. So at the time, we labeled this VT and that was it. But we can apply what we've just learned to predict where this VT is coming from. Remember our first question. Does the QRS in V1 look more like a right bundle or left bundle branch block pattern? It's upright, so we'll refer to it as a right bundle. Then look at lead one. It's upright, so the QRS vector is directed leftward. Then look at the inferior leads. They are all upright, meaning an inferior axis. So using our nomenclature, this is an RBLIVT. And if we look at the R wave progression to determine basal versus apical, we see that there is positive concordance, which means a basal location. So putting all this together, the suggested site of origin is the basal anterior septal LV. Another example, this one is a little trickier. There is a left bundle pattern in lead V1. Lead one is downgoing, 
so a rightward directed VT, and the inferior leads have negative complexes, so a superior axis. So this is LBRSVT with negative concordance in the precordial leads. When thinking about the site of origin, the left bundle suggests the RV or potentially septum. However, the rightward axis in lead one seems to suggest a lateral focus, which initially seems to contradict the left bundle until you remember that a rightward axis can also be seen in apical VT of the septum or even the RV. And the superior axis seen in the inferior leads strongly suggests an inferior location. So putting all that together, the suggested site of origin is the apical inferior septum, though a VT originating from the RV apex could also potentially have a similar appearance. Before moving away from scar-related VT, I want to address something that may have occurred to you. In contrast to focal VTs, which by definition originate from a specific small region of myocardium, reentrant VTs can have macroscopic reentry circuits that span a third or more of the ventricular chamber. What specific point of the circuit is being referred to as the location or the so called site of origin? In short, the site of origin is defined as the point in which the depolarization wavefront exits the scar region and spreads to the rest of the myocardium. In practical terms, if during an EP study a wire was positioned at the site of origin of a reentrant VT, the delivery of electric current at that location would result in PVCs or induced VT of an identical morphology to the intrinsic arrhythmia. Now, I'm going to switch from localizing scar-related VT to identifying idiopathic VTs. As said earlier, cases of idiopathic VTs tend to cluster in very specific cardiac structures, which is how they are identified and labeled. As with localizing scar-related VT, there is not one standardized way to organize the idiopathic VTs anatomically, but this schema incorporates the most common points. There are outflow tract VTs, which are divided into RVOT and LVOT, the former being the most common of all idiopathic VTs, and the latter being subdivided into those arising from the aortic cusp, a structure called the aortomitral continuity, or AMC, and a region called the LV summit. The cusp VTs are subdivided based on which cusp is involved. The left coronary cusp is the most common of those. Next are the vesicular VTs, which arise from within the fascicles. Because these come from within the conduction system network, they tend to be relatively narrow and are the most likely to be mistaken for SVT. These include VT from the left posterior fascicle, the left anterior fascicle, and what's referred to as high septal VT or upper septal VT. A rhythm called bundle branch reentrant tachycardia is sometimes grouped with the vesicular VTs based on a similar approach to studying and ablating it in the EP lab, but most cases are observed in patients with advanced heart failure, so it's not technically an idiopathic VT. Annular VTs arise from around one of the two atrioventricular valves, and there are some miscellaneous sites, such as the papillary muscles, the moderator band, and epicardial VTs. Despite myself previously presenting VT as either being scar-related or idiopathic, it's important to realize that the distinction is not always clear, as evidenced by bundle branch reentrant VT, which electrophysiologically acts like an idiopathic VT, despite almost always being observed in patients with structural heart disease. But in addition, all the idiopathic VTs can potentially be seen in patients with heart failure or ischemic heart disease. For example, even if RVOT VT is not specifically associated with heart failure, their underlying physiologies are not mutually exclusive, and this unfortunately creates some inconsistency with the terminology. At this point of the potential sites of idiopathic VT in the table, I'm going to discuss examples of the six most common. First up is the most common of all idiopathic VTs, RV outflow tract VT. Distinguishing features include the left bundle branch block pattern in V1, which makes sense since it's arising from the RV, an inferior axis, 
Again, makes sense since the RV outflow tract is a relatively superior and anterior structure. And key to distinguishing RV OT from aortic cusp VT is the precordial R wave transition is either at or later than V3. In this example, V5 is about equal parts positive and negative, demonstrating this feature. Let's compare that to an aortic cusp VT. In this case, the V1 left bundle branch pattern isn't quite as pronounced, and that's partially because the precordial R wave transition is much earlier, happening sometime between V1 and V2. One thing you might have wondered about, if the LVOT is part of the LV, why do LVOT VTs have a left bundle branch block pattern that would otherwise suggest they come from the right ventricle? The extremely short answer is that the heart is a complex three-dimensional anatomic structure resulting in some empiric observations that feel counterintuitive to what we might otherwise expect. So it is an exception to the general rule that a predominantly negative QRS complex in V1 suggests a right ventricular origin. Although there are five papillary muscles in the heart, almost all papillary muscle VTs originate from the two within the left ventricle. EKG features include a right bundle branch block pattern in V1, a QRS width of at least 130 milliseconds, sometimes much longer, and R wave notching in V1 to V3 or later. The QRS axis depends on which muscle is involved. VTs from the posterior medial papillary muscle have a superior or leftward axis. VTs from the anterior lateral papillary muscle have an inferior axis. Overall, these can look very similar to fascicular VTs, but tend to have a relatively longer QRS duration. Here's an example of posterior medial papillary muscle VT, tall R in V1, QRS width over 130 milliseconds, R wave notching in V1 through V3, and an inferior axis. Fascicular VTs are reentrant tachyrhythmias that originate from within the fascicular network of the left ventricle. As mentioned earlier, there are three main types, one for each fascicle and a rarer high septal form that originates from the region where the left posterior and anterior fascicles branch off from one another. Since they are originating from within the left ventricle's conduction system, it's easy to predict that they have a right bundle branch block pattern in V1, a relatively narrow QRS width that can even fall into the normal range, and an RS interval under 80 milliseconds. The RS interval is the time between the onset of the R wave and the nadir of the S wave. The QRS axis depends on the pathway. Posterior fascicular VTs have a leftward or superior axis. Anterior fascicular VTs have a rightward axis, and high septal VTs have a normal axis. As you might imagine, with a relatively narrow QRS complex and often with an appearance that's classic for an otherwise unremarkable bifascicular block, these can be easily mistaken for an SVT with aberrant conduction. The first clue that a patient has fascicular VT rather than SVT with aberrancy is to see no aberrancy, that is, to see a normal QRS complex, in the baseline EKG when the patient is clearly in sinus rhythm. Other classic features of fascicular VTs include the rhythm being unresponsive to vagal maneuvers and adenosine, but these are sensitive to verapamil. Similar to other idiopathic VTs, they tend to occur in younger patients without structural heart disease, and they typically present with palpitations rather than syncope or hypotension. Here's a posterior fascicular VT. We see a classic right bundle branch block pattern in V1, a relatively narrow QRS complex. In this case, it's about 120 milliseconds. The RS interval is under 80. And there is a left axis deviation that's almost at negative 90 degrees here. And here is an anterior fascicular VT that looks similar with the exception that the axis is now right deviated around positive 120 degrees in this case. And here is something called bundle branch reentry VT. In this rhythm, a reentrant circuit exists in which the right and left bundle branches each make up part of the reentry circuit. In its typical form, the impulse travels down the right bundle, across non specialized myocardium, and slowly back up components of the left bundle. 
Thus, a left bundle branch block pattern is more common than right. The overall ventricular rate is very fast, usually over 200 beats per minute. Discussing this in the section on idiopathic VT is misleading, as I've already indicated. You know, bundle branch reentry is typically seen in patients with advanced structural heart disease who have baseline QRS prolongation. Related to that and the fast rate, this rhythm often causes syncope and hemodynamic instability, and it has a prognosis similar to scar-based VT rather than the idiopathic VTs. I'm going to close this video with three other specific rhythms that are related to what we've been talking about today. The first is this rhythm. Looking at it, it's a regular, wide complex rhythm with no obvious atrial activity. It looks like VT, except the rate is only 120 beats per minute, which is really slow for classic VT. This is what is referred to as, quote, slow VT. There is not consensus on how fast the rate can be and still be called slow, with some references citing 120 as the upper cutoff, while others cite 150. Slow VT is most commonly seen in patients on antiarrhythmics, which slow the speed of conduction through the reentrant circuit. It also can be seen in patients with an unusually large reentrant circuit due to a very large infarct scar or due to a dilated chamber. Slow VT is important to consider as it is relatively common to be mistaken for SVT with aberrancy. And in addition, for patients with an ICD or a defibrillator, Sometimes the rate of slow VT can fall below the detection limit of the device, meaning that the ICD will not shock the patient. If a ventricular rhythm has an even slower rate, it is referred to as an accelerated idioventricular rhythm, or AIVR. The rate here is 50 to 100 beats per minute. It's most commonly observed in the 24 hours after reperfusion in patients who have experienced an acute MI. While you might initially mistake this for sinus with aberrancy due to its slow rate, relatively narrow QRS complex, and occasional P waves, the presence of effusion beat and multiple capture beats seen in this particular example means that the predominant rhythm must be ventricular. This is also a good example of isorhythmic AV dissociation, in which the sinus node is firing at almost an identical rate to the ventricular rhythm, giving the illusion that some P waves are being conducted prior to the wide QRS complexes. Isorhythmic dissociation also explains why this EKG can have multiple capture beats in a row. And the very last EKG of today is this dramatic rhythm. It's a regular, relatively monomorphic rhythm with an extremely fast rate, greater than 250. The waveforms flow directly into one another with no isoelectric points in any lead, forming a sinusoidal pattern in which it becomes impossible to distinguish QRS from T. Sometimes this is described as the EKG more or less looking the same upside down. This is called ventricular flutter. It's almost always pulseless and usually will quickly degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. That concludes this video on ventricular tachycardia. Please consider subscribing to Strong Medicine to check out the entire series on EKG interpretation, as well as a large collection of videos on other medical topics.